Open your Bibles this morning. We only have one scripture to start. Luke 14. We're going to go verse 27. I want to say hello to those of you watching at home, live streaming, or on television. It's exciting to have you with us. God bless you. Luke 14. Let's begin, church, in verse 27. Jesus speaking, Luke writing. Whoever does not bear his cross, her cross, and come after me, the Lord says, cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he or she is able to finish it, has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish all those who see it begin to mock, saying, this man, this woman, began to build, couldn't finish what they started. There's a word, <coughs> excuse me, there's a word family been bouncing around in my head. It's kind of trickled, seeped down into the marrow of my spirit for the last 10 days. So I've been, I've been talking to, I, I talked to Rick about it for a couple of days, and Dustin Hawkins, who's got a very fertile mind, and Clint Brown. And I said, talk to me about the word intention. Say intention. So we spent maybe hours just, Rick said, you know, I preached uh, about a, two years ago on engaging intention. And in fact, while I was at Rick's house, I read a book, The Power of Intention. And I began taking notes and, and, and thinking about this word. So we're going we're gonna to camp out for 20, 30 minutes on this one word. And then the next time we get together, you can pray for me because I'm leaving for Paraguay which is way down by Argentina at super early, early, early in the morning. I've been invited to be uh, the keynote speaker at a conference. This church has like 100,000 plus people. It is huge. And I'll be speaking, I think, five times there and then back over to Lima, Peru, as my friend Pastor Sergio has taken over the church from his, his daddy. And uh, they, they've both been daddy and, and Serge have both, and Carla have both been here. To Jubilee several times, and they're having a they're having a transformation conference, and I'll be down there a, a few days. So you could throw up a prayer for travel and mercy, but most importantly that God uses me. I've got a lot of sermons going through my head, but I want to make sure I bring a message to the house. Amen, everybody. Well, this this morning, I want us to look at the word intention. For which of you intending to build a tower was our narrative, our text out of the Gospel of St. Luke. I retweeted a tweet that I really enjoyed the other day, and if you follow me, I just got on Periscope, so I just, just in the back room, I just got on Periscope. You know, for a caveman, I'm learning to be a little techie here, so bear with me with all these things. But I love this tweet, let me share it with you. The greatest shipbuilders in the history of the world built the greatest ship in the history of the world, the Titanic. An amateur built the ark. One sunk, one didn't. Why? Man built the Titanic. Noah followed God's design. When you follow God's design, you won't seek. You get Jesus in the boat, and when he says, cross over to the other side, I don't care what comes at you, hell, high water, tsunami, storms, swells, whirlpools, great white sharks, I don't care what tries to take you down. You do it by God's design, you follow God's intention, and you're going to get to the other side. And your boat will float in Jesus' name. Amen, everybody? Well, what, you know, when I, when I get a word that's just stick to me like Velcro, I start doing word study. I'm not going to wear you out with, with a lot of this, but let me just share a little bit. Webster's basically says, in a nutshell, that which is expected in the future. Intention. The etymology, it's a Latin word that evolved, if you will, kind of morphed into French and from French to the English word intention. You, you kind of put all these together, and what you get from the original is to, to stretch or to reach towards, to lean, to lean into. I like this, to direct one's attention to. The word attention, Larry, comes from the word intention. How do you, 
How many of you know God knows how to get our attention when we get away from his intention? Look at the history of the Jews. They started drifting away. They started worshiping differently. They started living uh, an immoral life. God knew how to get their attention. He stopped the rain. He brought Syria. He brought the Persians, captivity, what have you. God knows how to get our attention if we disconnect from his intention. Are you with me? So we're going to call this engaging the power of intention. In Genesis 1.1, it starts off, in the beginning. How many of you know, in the beginning is not the beginning? In the beginning is not the beginning. Before there was creation, there was intention. Before God acted, before God said, he first thought. Before he spoke. Are you following me? Intention comes before creation. Let's work this out a little bit. In the first chapter of, of Genesis, we see, of course, creation. We see time is set. The universe, then the stars, then, of course, our sun, our moon, and time is now in motion. This thing called time. Then we see the land and the sea separated by God's intention. He calls the land earth. He calls the water seas. He then sets in motion reproduction, the grassy fields, fruit, vegetables, trees, what have you, have intrinsic life within themselves, which allows creation to reproduce. Nature, agriculture, we call it. Then the animal kingdom on the earth and in the sea also has the ability to keep the species going, primarily through male and female and what we call mating seasons. We're talking about intention now. This is all by God's intention. Then we get to Genesis 126. We read a little bit. Then God said, now let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Watch now, dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I always say this when I read this, girls, you have dominion over creeps. <laughs> Remember that. So God created in his own image, the image of God. He created him, male and female, them. Isn't that interesting? He created him, male and female. He created them. It goes from him to them. Then God blessed them. Yeah, by intention. This is God's intention. Be fruitful. That's God's intention. Multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea. Be fruitful means be successful. Multiply means have kids. Fill the earth. Populate this, this planet. Subdue it and have dominion because there's enemies. At this time of this narrative, the enemy was invisible, Satan, and his minions. Say intention one more time. I like verse 31, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. First he said good many times, now he says it's very good, so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right, now, where am I going with this? The plant kingdom and the animal kingdom don't argue with God's intention. They're in harmony, they're in concert. Salmon, they live about five years. They're born in a creek, a stream. Somehow they make it to the ocean. They stay out there for about four years, feed, get big. And we still don't know how they know to get right back to the very place. I mean, through bears, rapids, fishermen like me, you name it. And lay their eggs so that the species can continue. A bear knows how to hibernate. Why? Intention. I always carry acorns. I always have an acorn with me. I have them in my car. I have them in my office. See this little acorn? He's never prayed. Doesn't have a vision. Doesn't have a dream. Doesn't go to church. Doesn't worship God. The acorn has intention. It's the power of God 
inside this acorn, this acorn intends to be an oak tree. With a little luck, with a planting, with a squirrel dropping it accidentally, dirt covering it, there is a power in every acorn that wants to be an oak tree. Are you following me? An apple blossom, a pretty little apple blossom. It's pretty. But that's not the end. That's not the intention. The apple blossom wants to be an apple. It doesn't struggle. It doesn't fast. It doesn't have to go to church. Doesn't argue with its creator. Doesn't have emotion. It simply is in harmony with God's intention. I'll say it again. Intention comes before creation. I'm going to go somewhere with this. Because God has an intention for you. From the beginning. But the problem is when we get to man. Here's his intention. Be successful. Multiply. Fill the earth. Have dominion and have rule. That's God's intention. What the problem is, man disconnected from God's intention in the garden and fell. But God still has intention for every one of us who have his spirit in us. Are you following me? Intention. I really want you to get a, a hold of, of this word. Now, the problem with us human beings is we do think. That acorn doesn't think. We do have an ego. That apple blossom has no ego. Ego is not going to interfere with that apple blossom becoming an apple. But we human beings, we know how to disconnect from the source. I have, a, like you, a cell phone. And I, I, don't know why I, I don't know why I got this two-part charger. One night, I looked at my phone. It was about 18, you know, had about 18% left. So I'm tired, and I'm kind of in a hurry and getting ready to go to bed. So I plugged, I plugged this into the power source called a socket. PG&E, electricity. And I plugged the little thing down here, male and female. It's amazing what happens when male and female get together. Praise the Lord. <laughs> By God's intention. But what I didn't do was I didn't totally hear the click when I put the end of my little cable into here. This was plugged into the power source. And I was plugged in correctly here, but I didn't totally engage this little thing. Thought I did. I had good intention. I get up the next morning, grab my phone, get in the car, got stuff to do, people to talk to, things to take care of, turn my phone on, dead. Dead. My first thought was, something's wrong with this phone. I got another lemon. I even stopped at the AT&T store. The guy said, it just needs to be charged. It's fine. I said, but I charged it last night. He said, are you sure? Now watch. My first thought was, maybe the power went off. Now, what are you laughing at? Because sometimes we blame God for things. I thought, maybe the power went off last night. Because if he says, he checked it, your phone's fine. just needs a charge. Now, I got a car charger. And I got in I, and it started working. Well, when I got home later that afternoon, I looked at it. And, I, and when I grabbed the cable, it kind of fell out. And I went, I didn't. See, here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of us think we're engaged to God's plan. When really, it's our plan. It's, it's not God's desire. It's not his marked destiny. It, it, it's not what he has for us, before the foundations of the world, it's our ego. It's our self-will. It's our desires. And we want God to bless it. Abraham, he holds up, uh, he holds up uh, uh, Ishmael. Oh, Lord, 
the son of promise. And God says, no, I told you, you and Sarah are going to have a baby. But you disengaged from my intention and you got in the flesh. And now you have produced a work of the flesh and you want me to bless it. You know the story. Let me show you something on the screen of what disconnects us. Is when we look at ourselves, I am what I have. That's who I am. I am what I do. That's who I am. I am what others say I am. Or I am my body and how it looks. In other words, my self-worth, my esteem, my happiness is based on one of those things. Instead of being connected to God and his purpose for all of us. Are you still with me? You all know what a mule is? Somebody tell me what a mule is. Let me tell you what a mule is. A mule is a female horse and a male donkey. Two, two complete different species. Male donkey, female horse, come together, mate, produces a mule. Now, mules are amazing. They're not quite as big as a horse. They're not as small as a donkey. They're stronger in many ways, more sure-footed in many ways, but there's a little problem. They're a hybrid. I'm not talking about a Toyota, so <laughs> they're a hybrid. They cannot reproduce. You have two separate species. Now, I just read because of scientific breakthrough in vitro things and all that, that they're learning how to you know, do some things. Uh, but I'm talking about in the natural way of species reproducing after their own kind, the law of Genesis. Mules are a product of man's ingenious, if you will, not God's intention. Let me say this again. Everything God creates has the ability to reproduce. Man, woman, children. Are you following me? Seedless grapes. I love seedless grapes. You don't have to. <laughs> green grapes. Where did green seedless grapes come from? Not the law of Genesis. Seedless. I give you a hint. Seedless means they can't reproduce by the law of Genesis. God's intention, Victor. Now, you have to. You have to get a cutting. You have to plant. You can, you can grow seedless grapes, but it's man. It's not the natural pollinization. It's not cross all that stuff that agricultural people understand, agri-people understand. What, what am I saying? How many, how many of our plans are hybrid? They look good. They taste good. They're strong. They're pretty. People like it. But there's no blessing of reproduction in it. So, how do we get back? We've all got some Ishmaels in our life. We've all got a few hybrids in our life where we wanted God to bless. Lord, I, if, Lord if, I, if I don't get him, I'm just going to die. He's the one. And God is saying, no, he's not the one. I'm protecting you. I'm not going to church no more. God doesn't answer my prayers. Or... Other things. How do we get back? How do we get back to connecting with God's intention? Well, I wrote a, I wrote a few things down here, and, and let's kind of let's let's go over them. Look at the screen with me. First step. First step is obvious. It's humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, surrender, repent, so we don't repeat. One of the hardest things to do is admit you're wrong. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's got a relative. He said, you cannot get this joker to say, ever, I was wrong, I'm sorry, ever. 
you confront him on something and he will go, he will go, he will just start talking about this, that victim mentality. Just can't get him to say, my bad, you're right. And the Bible says, humble yourself or God will humble you. Humble yourself privately and God won't expose you publicly. You know, see, you know what I'm talking about? And, and surrender, surrender to like, God, I've tried this, I've tried that. What is it you want me to do? Why am I here? Number two, look at number two. Rediscover. Oh, there's, we've got so many, so many misconceptions, perceptions of this thing called love. Uh, people are mad at me because I won't marry gay people. So because I've made a public statement to the press and what have you, I'm just not going to marry gay people. doesn't mean I hate them. I'll tell them, I'll tell them where to, there's an Episcopalian street with a rainbow flag out there, down, church down the street. There's, there's, go to Tahoe, go to Justice of the Peace. There's all kinds of places, but please don't try to force your belief on me. I'm not forcing my belief on you. Listen. I'm not, I'm not trying to force gay people to not be gay. I'm not trying to force gay people, you better get saved or going to hell. So quit trying to force me through the courts or whatever to bow my knee to something I don't believe in. I believe marriage is ordained by God between a man and a woman who are saved. I, I won't marry people who aren't saved. Man, woman. I will not. I refuse. I will not marry people that are not born again in church and, and accepting, putting Christ in the middle of their marriage because I know it's it's destined for a divorce before it even starts. We don't have a divorce problem in America. We got a marriage problem. People get married for all the wrong reasons. Well, she's pregnant. Well, that doesn't mean you have to get married. Certainly doesn't mean you have to have an abortion. Well, I just like the way he looks in his Levi's. Oh, that's gonna last for about four months. <laughs> he is so fine. Mm-hmm. Hmm. <laughs> there's, four, there's, four, there's four main words for love. It's funny how church, most church people don't even connect these dots. The first one's agape. Most of you know that. Agape is the divine, pure, holy love of God that's in you because you're born again. Which means we can love the world. We can love everybody in the world. But we also love the word. We don't, see here's the problem. People want to be Christians without believing the Bible. Well, the God, I, the, the God I know loves everybody. <laughs> Unwrap that. What do you mean by that? He loves everybody. Does that, mean he, does that mean he tolerates everything we do? Like no matter, because he loves us so much that there's no discipline, there's no correction? Are you kidding me? You ever see people raise kids with no discipline? Prisons are full of them. Prisons are full of them. My grandma believed in spanking. This is before the ACLU got involved and all these other. Uh, and every now and then, she would cross over into beating. I'd go to school like. But I, you know, wasn't child abuse. She loved me. I was wrong. I was a naughty little boy. I did things. I lied. And she caught me and, and she corrected me. My mama too. Agape, it's the love of God. Then there's phileo, which is brotherly love, affection. Philadelphia, city brotherly love. Then there's stergo, which is parental love. Daddy, mommy, child. Adopting is wonderful. Foster parenting is wonderful. But stergo really means you created a child. And you got that special parental love for this child. Then there's eros, which is, we get the word erotic. It's kind of an aggressive Greek word. But it simply is uh, sexual interaction, pleasure. Eros. What's fascinating, my two sisters here, is the only place, only place in the world, the only place in the Bible you see all four is in a marriage with children between two believers. Two believers have agape. They have affection. They have stergo because they produced a child, children. And they have eros, obviously, they had sex. What about if you're single? Well, you have two. If you're single, if you're born again, you're single. You have agape and you have phileo. You don't have stergo because you have no children. 
unless you're a single parent, and you, you shouldn't be doing the arrows thing. <laughs> shouldn't be anyway. How about gay people? Well, gay people have phileo. They have affection. Sure they do. They know how to have some brotherly love, especially towards their own community. Very helpful to one another and united and, and all of that. And uh, uh, they have arrows, obviously. But can I say this without embarrassing the children? Man and woman are the only creation of God that can procreate face to face. Eyeball to eyeball. Animals can't, gay people can't. Ain't mad at nobody. But see, the intention of God, the intention of God for sex was between a man and a woman. I'm not saying missionary style is the only thing. Come on, work with me. <laughs> but see, the, the, frontal, the frontal cortex, the frontal cortex is where our emotions are. Right? Eyes are the window of the soul. So lovemaking is more than a physical act. It's spiritual and it's soulical. Your spirit, soul, and body, face to face, in the act of lovemaking or procreation, it, by God's intention. Y'all blushing. Even black people are blushing. <laughs> Troy. I just wanted to throw that out. We're talking about intention before creation. Are you following me? You know I'm going to get emails. I don't care. Hey, Amen. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Ask me if I care. Look at number three. We're trying to get back. We're trying to get back to God's intention. There's got to be some discipline. Followers are called disciples, not just hanger honors, wannabes. In fact, he lost most of them. He preached his worst sermon ever. You must. He had, they say he had up to 50,000 people following him. He preached one little sermon. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's like, see ya. I've preached some bad sermons, but I ain't lost no 50,000 people. And he was, he was throwing out a spiritual truth, but they took it carnally, literally, in a sense, and said, that goes against the law of Moses. That goes against this. And they, but Jesus was, Jesus was testing to see who's really hungry for truth. In fact, he asked the disciples, you staying or going? I think it was Peter said, we don't know where to go, but could you not preach that ever again? <laughs> Let's delete that one. Discipline. We need to get discipline. We need, some, we need to get on a spiritual, intelligent diet. We put more junk in our mind than we do in our belly. We should watch our belly. We should watch our bodies. We should, we should try to... We should try to these bodies are gifts from God. We should try to exercise a little more and eat a little better and, 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 and walk and, and, and do things that, that keep this body strong and then watch what we put into our brain, our mind, and, 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 and stuff that might get down and defile our spirit. We need, we need more discipline in time and talent and money and all of that. Number four, quickly. Never stop learning. Be hungry. Read books. Read, read books. Listen to... Podcasts and CDs and, and learn about history. I spent like four hours yesterday on Winston Churchill, maybe, maybe the greatest human being of the 20th century. That, that this, guy, this guy like preached England to victory. He was amazing. He believed in God. He was, this man was amazing. His, his, his gift. And I, I love learning about great, great, great men in, in history along with, you know, the, the patriarchs of the church. Never, never stop learning. I love learning things. I love studying. I love being blessed by, by good information. You know, there's two words. We've talked about this before. There's two words we use a lot. Enthusiasm and inspiration, right? Do you know where those words came from? Christians. Inspiration means spirit in you. In spirit. Look how inspired they are. It's because God's spirit's in them. The Greeks came up with the word enthusiastic. Entheos in the Greek. Theos is God. Theology is the study of God. In, 
in theos means the reason they're so happy, the reason they're so excited is God's in them. These new Christians, first century church. Look at these new followers of Christ. Look how in theos they are. Are you following me? Well, smile like you have a little bit of it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to continue this, but I'm, I'm about done. Most people in the world, I was reading a book on intention. And here's a, here's a, a statistic night from 2000, I think, 12. Most, peop, most people in the world wonder why they're here. Wondering leads to wandering. And people end up in the desert. People end up in the wilderness. No focus, no direction, which leads to no purpose. I want you to stand up with me. No purpose because they never really got connected. I'm going to show you my last little thing on the screen up here. You all know what that is. That's called the double helix. Your DNA. Your genetic code. Chromosomes, proteins, aminos, and all those things that make you unique. Nobody's like you from your fingertips to stuff that's inside there that I can't even pronounce. They're still discovering. It's called the double helix. God put that in you. He used your parents. Yes, he did. God put that in you. But let me tell you what else he put in you before the sperm reached the egg, male and female. He put intention and purpose. That's the double spiritual helix God put. Now, obviously, we know something about, you know something about me? My dad was six foot three. I'm kind of built like him. Jesse, Adam, and me, walk just, we walk just like my dad. That's why out in Texas, they call me Uncle Duke in Texas, you know. They call me Uncle Duke because I walk like John Wayne. Because my daddy walked like John Wayne. I got my mother's nose. Wendy and Judy's got daddy's mouth and nose. I can see daddy and my sisters. They can see grandma and mama. And it, when I get up in the morning, I got hair like grandpa, stand straight out. <laughs> I look like Gumby in the morning. It just <laughs> DNA. Passed down. I know some of you think you were born in the shallow end of the gene pool. Because you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Listen, I was born with a plastic picnic spoon in my mouth. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter how you got here. The thing is, mom and dad got you here. And God stuck stuff in there on purpose. Your personality. Because we're all to reach people. Because if you're born again, that means the seed of God is in you, and we're supposed to reproduce. If we don't reproduce, we're a hybrid. We're a mule. We're nothing but seedless grapes. I got thinking this yesterday. How many hybrids have I come up with? Things I thought were God. Things I thought were, and I followed and spent money and tried this and tried that, and there was no blessing because... It was my idea, or somebody gave me an idea, and it wasn't in my DNA. It wasn't in my spiritual helix, what God wants Dick Brunel to do. At my age, I'm still discovering my destiny. I'm still discovering my purpose. And I know, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. I can't help you with the way you are. That, that came from birth. Your skin color, your height. Still got hair, ain't got hair, never had hair. <laughs> Whatever. But maybe I can help you. Remember, again, Latin to French to English means to lean into. Tension means to push towards. It means to have attention. God has intention. Pay attention. Church, pay attention. Remember at school? Pay attention. Dickie, wake up. Pay attention. Okay. That's what God's trying to do. Church, pay attention. I have intention. Because 
I have things for you to create by my power. But you got to plug into the source. So maybe, 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 maybe this is the first visit to Jubilee, and maybe it's your last visit to Jubilee, but you were supposed to be here by God's intention. I don't know why you're here up in the balcony, but you're here. You see, God intended you to be here. And those of you that have been here for 20, 30 years, and you're still learning, you're still, that's good. Little by little, here and there, precept upon precept, we, Paul says, I press intention. Paul says, I lean into, I press towards the mark of my calling, my high calling of my Father in Christ. Paul, you read his writings, you can, you can hear his struggle. You can, he, he says things like, I still do things I don't want to do, and I, I don't do things I should do. Pray for me. Oh, Jesus. And here's the great apostle. What's, he's still struggling. He's still pressing into. Why? Because he desires to find God's intention. For his existence. You were born for such a time as this. It's 2015 and we're still vertical. We're walking on grass, not looking up at grass. We're here. Let's make the best of it. Let's find out what God has for us. Collectively, individually. Amen. Amen. Let me see your fingertips. There's been there's almost 8 billion people. I don't know how many billions of people since Adam and Eve. Nobody's had those puppies. Nobody's had those but you, and nobody ever will. And there's things inside that double helix nobody in the history of the world will ever have. God's intention for you is unique. Don't let other people define or tell you what they think God has for you. You get that from Him. And maybe, maybe, by the preaching, Adam Bernal, Michael Pitts, whoever, Dick Bernal, whoever is in this pulpit, Splendor at the Bay, maybe you'll get a rhema, you'll get a word from the Lord that will help you just take another step closer to the reason for your earthly season. Father, as we stand before you today, Lord, I help those watching on television, those watching live streaming, those precious people that stand here in the balcony on the bottom floor. I hope having ears to hear, we heard. Having spiritual eyes to see, we see. Having a wide open heart, Lord, as I said earlier. Lord, teach us to humble ourselves so that life won't humble us. I don't want to be embarrassed by some unconfessed, unrepented mistake or sin. Lord, I want to, I want to humble myself I want to admit my errors, thoughts, misconceptions, ideas, visions that are not from you. Lord, I'm not the youngest guy in the world. I don't have a whole lot of time to waste a lot of time. I want to make every day count. Lord, you tell me what to preach in Paraguay. I got ideas, but you tell me what they need. You tell me what to preach in Lima. You tell me when I come back here, what I should say part two of this. I got all kinds of things I can do and say, but Lord, that would be Dick Brunel talking to my friends and not the Holy Spirit using me to make announcements from heaven that we are here by design and not by accident. Lord, as we leave today, let us remember the mission field is right through these doors. We will see people, talk to people, meet people we've never seen, never met, may never meet again. Let the love of Christ, the light of Christ shine through us where we eat, where we go to play, where we stay, our neighbors, family, or friends. Jesus, use us to show agape love to a dying world. Somebody agree with me by saying amen. Love you, everybody.